I thought it would be quite useful just to have a, a bit of a chat around our recent developments in the kind of Java ecosystem, and namely around the Log4J incident. Uh, obviously, the, the 10th of December last year uh, was an interesting day for, for the majority of uh, people in our ecosystem. Um, I would be very interested to hear anybody's kind of experiences of, of that day, to be honest with you, good, good or bad. Um, we, at, um, we at Crunch had, a, had an interesting day that, that I'll, I'll come on to um, shortly. Um, just a little bit of background about myself, just in case you haven't um, spoken to me before. Uh, my name's Lee. Uh, I'm the lead backend dev at Crunch. So basically that means that myself and the other backend devs um, maintain our suite of, uh, I guess, about just over 70 services um, that we have now, plus our kind of legacy accounting app. Crunch is, is an accountancy firm. It, it, they build a, an accountancy and tax platform, which is what we manage and maintain. Um, I'm also a Sneak ambassador. Um, Sneak is a, a dev first security company. Um, uh, the Sneak ambassador is, a, is a, a voluntary role for people who are passionate about kind of application security and, and things like that. Sneak support. Um, and amplify uh, those ambassadors. So uh, if you're interested in, in anything around that, uh, just Google Sneak Ambassadors um, and you'll find all the information. They, they are looking for more people to join that program. So uh, it'd be great if uh, that's something that interests you, then definitely, definitely take a look. Uh, you, can, you can grab me on Twitter uh, at Lee Turner and uh, my website there, um, leeturner.me, has all of, the, uh, all of the ways you uh, can connect with me online. So take a look there. Uh, as I'm sure you know by now, uh, I help run Brian Jug and Brian Kotlin. Um, if you're uh, remotely interested in, in Kotlin alongside Java, um, then come along uh, to our meetup, first one this year, uh, next week. Um, so that'd be great to see you there. This is what I'm going to chat about today. Um, the, there's, there's not a huge amount that I'm going to go through, but um, I think it's important that we kind of reevaluate where we are um, in, in our kind of ecosystem and what it means to be a, a Java developer in, in kind of a post log for shell uh, world. So we're going to go over what, what it was, what it is. Uh, I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on that. because I imagine that the majority of us have, uh, have kind of fully understood that or, or quite possibly sick of hearing about it by now. Um, but just to kind of get a baseline, um, I thought I'd kind of go over it and we'll cover it off. Um, we're going to have a little bit of a chat about what the landscape is for us as Java developers now, and also um, what we mean by the whole shift left concept. And then right at the very end, I'm going to we're going to talk about making the invisible visible and kind of what that means or, or what I what I think it means anyway. So log for shell. I think, I think it's fair to say that this is probably as bad as it gets um, as far as uh, vulnerabilities in our ecosystem. Um, it, it was classed as, as the highest criticality uh, of a vulnerability that you can possibly get, um, largely because it, it kind of allowed the holy grail of um, vulnerabilities, which is remote code execution. That's like what everybody wants to achieve. Um, it was a zero day vulnerability on the, the 10th of December when, when it was disclosed, which means that there's no uh, solutions for it at this point in time, or the solutions that are available uh, are not um, well enough known to, to make a difference. Um, it's highly prevalent and easily exploitable. Um, all you needed to do was just add a string to something that gets logged by Log4j and you have the potential to take over a server. Um, it seemed like there were proof of concepts available right from the start. Um, I don't know what your experiences were, but at Crunch, when we got in on that morning and we started evaluating our exposure to this vulnerability, um, we were seeing people prodding our services, uh, prodding our infrastructure um, with log4j, um, JNDI references, um, right from the start, right from the early morning on the 10th. And most of those were exactly like what the proof of concepts um, showed. So I think it looked like most people had just taken those proof of concepts uh, and started pinging them out on the internet. Um, so 
it, it could have been an absolute nightmare, and I'm sure it was for, for a lot of people. Um, this is, hopefully you can see that, it's a bit smaller, I appreciate, but this is the kind of like how the log for j um, or the log for shell um, vulnerability um, happened. All you need to do is log out a, a JNDI reference to some kind of LDAP server, um, log for j try to connect to that server, download some code and run it in the current JVM process. So you're, you're literally risking remote code execution, remote server control, cloud security control failures, um, regular, regulatory compliance failures. The, the, the whole thing is, is pretty, pretty dangerous. Um, obviously in this instance, we're downloading evil.class um, which does a, a RM minus RF. Uh, but that could actually be anything. Um, this is a, an example of something that could be downloaded and, and run into the um, Java process, um, which basically just curls out the password file. Uh, but effectively, we're talking about anything here. So ransomware, malware, server app takeovers, database uh, dumps, um, the, the, whole, the whole gamut is available to us, really. So... It, it was pretty bad, um, I think it's fair to say. Um, what made this such um, a problem is that Log4j is just one of the most popular logging libraries out there. Um, I got some data from, uh, from Sneak customers, um, and it was used by 35% of, of Sneak customers. Um, mainly is transitive dependencies, so not used directly. Uh, it was used by just under 40% directly, but it was used mostly as a dependency of a dependency. Um, so 68, 60.8% uh, 60 as, as an indirect dependency, which is, is pretty huge. Um, the problem with that is that I guess you might not even know that you're using it if it's a transitive dependency. Um, so that's what made this such a, a massive problem for, for developers in our, in our ecosystem. Like I say, remote code execution, the holy grail. So just as a last thing on log, log for shell if, if you still are dealing with this in some way, shape, or form, and it is ongoing because it wasn't just that initial vulnerability that was the problem. Um, a fix was put in for that vulnerability, and then more vulnerabilities came, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is an awesome resource um, on, on GitHub. It's one of the kind of awesome lists um, resources that, um, that are so cool. Uh, take a look at that, and um, there, there's some really useful information on how to deal with that if, uh, if that's a problem for you still. So apart from all of the log for shell uh, memes that, that come out. Um, this is kind of how people view um, the current state of our, our development uh, ecosystem. Uh, not just Java, but uh, Node and, and things like that. When you've got uh, dependencies that are brought in and uh, written by people we don't know, um, basically just one of those could take down our, our entire infrastructure. Um, and that's kind of what happened with the log for shell incident. Um, I'm sure most of us who, who work um, in, in this kind of uh, environment, this kind of ecosystem, uh, put processes in place to help us kind of maintain the quality and security of our uh, the code that goes out, things like code reviews, and, and so on and so forth. Um, the problem we have is that we don't put the same kind of processes in place with the dependencies that we use in our services. So this is a prime example of, of why that can be an issue. And I think a lot of conversations sprouted from this around the fact that open source is broken um, and for this exact reason. Um, now, that's, that's not something that I'm particularly interested in going into here, whether you believe that open source, the open source model in general is, is broken, but I think it does, um, what I found most interesting is the, uh, the assumptions I think we make about open source software. And, and I think this, this is kind of, of, kind of highlights that really, really well. Now, uh, Ralph is one of the uh, maintainers of Log4j. I think he was actually the one that put the initial fix in on the 10th to fix the JNDI lookup issue. Um, 
Now, I, I kind of always had in my head that projects that were under the Apache banner were kind of well-funded, well-worked on, um, uh, and things like that. But that actually just isn't the case. You can see from, from his sponsorship page on GitHub here that actually he does this all in his spare time. Um, which is the case for a lot of the people who work on the Log4j project, from what I understand. So he has a job. He'd love to work in open source full time, but literally can't make that happen. Um, so this library that is used by so many people, hundreds and thousands of projects um, around the globe use Log4j, and it is basically supported by very few people in their spare time. Um, this, as you can imagine, has now changed. I think last time I checked, Ralph had like 74 sponsors um, on, on his GitHub sponsorship page, which is amazing. It's exactly uh, what, what needs to happen. Um, but I just found it interesting that the assumptions we make around is a log logging library from Apache better than a logging library from somebody else? Is a framework from um, you know VMware like Spring Boot better than... Uh, a framework from somewhere else. Um, and, and I think we do attribute qualities to those libraries that we don't necessarily verify. Um, an interesting outcome from this is that this has pretty much gone right to the top in terms of it, it is pretty much classed as a national security risk um, at the moment. I think uh, people from like Apple, Google, Facebook, um, IBM, Oracle, all met at the White House recently um, to discuss how this can be mitigated in the future um, and how they can form some kind of entity to bring together volunteers who are looking to help uh, open source projects and um, projects that, that need the support, um, which is really, really good. This is exactly kind of what needs to happen, but um, we, we really do not associate uh, or give the same kind of considerations to the libraries that we bring into our ecosystem and our apps, then we do the code that we write ourselves. So I think when, when we think about our apps, in our case at Crunch, we, we build services uh, mostly. So I, I think of a, a Spring Boot app um, and we think about it like this, but actually what we're really talking about is this kind of scenario. Um, the code that we write is, is just a really small percentage of what we we deploy into production. Um, I did pull the, the Spring Boot code down uh, just before this talk. And you know I, I can write uh, a Spring Boot service, which may be 10 lines of code, complete kind of hello world type thing. But when that goes out into production, there's Spring Boot alone has around like 40,000 lines of code that, that kind of go along with that, that I've never looked at, never reviewed. Um, that's just Spring Boot. That doesn't take into consideration uh, Spring Security or the other Spring libraries, all the dependencies that Spring has. So we're effectively looking at this um, in in completely the wrong way because we're, we're focusing only on our own code. And I guess most of the stuff in Spring Boot we probably don't don't use so you could argue that it doesn't matter uh, it's not a problem we don't use it but i guess we have to then question are we sure how do we know um i mean i would be really interested to see statistics on how many uh, developers actually knew that log4j could do jnd lookups um let alone um whether you know it's turned on by default and, and so on and so forth uh, i certainly didn't um, you know, our, our exposure to these libraries are, you know, logger.debug, logger.info, logger.error. Uh, um, the majority of what goes on in those libraries is, is a complete unknown, um, which is why we need to kind of change the way we, we kind of view these things. The Java landscape has also changed. I mean, I, I guess some of us will be um, looking at and maintaining uh, legacy apps, which may be a different kind of thing, but what our actual ecosystem is now is it's not just the bit of code that we write in um, the services, for example, uh, or the Spring Boot framework that we use. We also deploy uh, cloud native uh, for a lot of this stuff now. So 
what we actually have is our service wrapped up inside a container. Um, and then we might deploy into something like Kubernetes. Um, so each one of those areas has a completely different attack surface or you know, the ability to have vulnerabilities. Um, and that's where things get a little bit more tricky because as, as Java developers, we don't necessarily uh, have exposure to or, or understand what might be vulnerable about a container that we're deploying our app to, or what configuration options in a Kubernetes pod may mean that uh, that exposes something to the outside world that we're, we're just not uh, intending to. And then I guess it gets more complicated because we run kind of high availability in our production clusters uh, at Crunch, which means that we have a minimum of two pods running per service. And then you kind of get to the situation where you have multiple services running in production. We've got about just over 70. Um, and they're all based on the same version of Spring Boot and the same uh, Java version, but they're each doing different things. So although those base things are the same, we actually have subtly different dependencies for, for each of those services. Although they're all managed centrally by our you know, parent POM, it still means that we have um, different things going on in different services. So it, it becomes quite difficult to kind of manage all of that complexity um, without having something to, to support and help that. We're also in a situation where Java isn't the only thing that we deploy. So throw in kind of our front-end technologies and you're in a world where you have um, Node being run. We've got a React app running in Node. Um, inside a Kubernetes cluster, um, which opens up the attack surface even more than what it was before. Uh, I think when we started looking at this at Crunch, we scanned our node base images and we found 23 different vulnerabilities that were um, available in, in that base image we were using. All of them were solved and resolved by upgrading that base image, uh, which makes a huge, a huge difference. Basically, it kind of gets to this type of scenario. Um, it, it is a bit mind blowing and it, it's difficult to kind of maintain all of that complexity in one go. So in terms of the whole kind of concept of shifting left, we, we hear about that quite a bit in terms of security uh, and things like that. But we have done this for a long time as, as developers, we've always thought about the concept of shifting left. Um, you know, we, we have a whole pipeline of um, solutions to help us do that. Um, for, for the exact reason that the closer it gets to production, the more costly it is uh, to solve. Um, as it says on this slide, uh, as the stages progress, the cost of addressing any uh, uncovered bugs rises often exponentially. So we, we associate quality to the code that we write in, in certain ways. Now, that can be a very simplistic way of determining quality. So let's go kind of bare basic. Um, code coverage, for example. Now, I think we can all probably agree that code coverage in and of itself is it's probably more a vanity metric than anything else, but it's it's a useful guide to understanding how well our services or our code um, is tested. So we, we write tests, varying tests um, around uh, system uh, acceptance tests, integration component tests, unit tests, and, and we may even follow TDD. Um, we may use tools like mutation testing to then determine the quality of our tests. Um, and we may even employ kind of agile principles. Um, and all of this is determined to, to allow us to add value to the clients that we're building software for, either internally to our own, um, our own team or externally to, to our company's clients. Um, and we effectively want to improve deployment frequency um, in the most safe manner possible. Now, um, I don't know whether anybody on the call uh, does anything in the kind of chaos engineering, chaos experiments 
uh, area. We, we've kind of dabbled with that crunch and found it uh, really useful. Um, basically trying to move from um, known unknowns that we can figure out while we're testing to unknown unknowns, which uh, I guess is kind of more kind of chaos experiments. Um, so each of us have an idea of, of what we associate as, as quality for the code that we write. And we, we try and maintain that by, you know, pull requests. Um, we have PR processes or pair programming, like, like Helen said in, in the previous talk. Um, in those processes um, and those activities, we can, we can help guide people um, in the different areas that we associate to quality, like uh, reuse, uh, performance, and architectural principles, and, and things like that. And we even have processes to kind of bring this kind of full circle. So um, we have the concept of tech debt. So it may be that in the strive to deploy something out into production and get the value from that, we might have accepted a certain amount uh, of technical debt, uh, but that's a known quantity, it's logged, it's tracked, and we can bring that full circle um, back into a future sprint and address that then. Um, at Crunch, we have 20% uh, of each sprint uh, associated to tech debt for each team, which means that we've got a very good kind of loop back mechanism to address the things that um, we've allowed through. So um, all of these things come together to determine exactly what we mean by quality. Now, I think the, the key here is that when we think back to the kind of open source model and the dependencies that we use in our system, it's a very, uh, I don't really know any team that I, I've spoken to that gives the same kind of mechanisms to those dependencies that they use. They don't review the code. They don't look at the dependencies. They've got very little idea as to whether those uh, dependencies have vulnerabilities in it. And that is, I guess, the key problem that we, we need to move and move towards a solve um, as developers in, in the Java ecosystem or any ecosystem for that matter. Um, this was the real kind of light bulb moment for me, I think. The, the Secure Developer is um, a great podcast if you uh, are into the whole kind of AppSec area. Um, and this particular episode uh, had um, the Vice President of Infrastructure and Developer at VillageMD talking about how they approach the whole concept of application security um, and how various things that they have uh, tried, didn't work, um, and what actually ended up being the one that, that gained the most traction and made the most uh, difference um, to the developers and, and the code that they write. And it was really this concept of security needs to be uh, an attribute of quality. So all of those things, all of those metrics that we um, use to determine whether our code is quality um, whether that's test coverage, the tests that we write, whether there's <coughs> alerting and metrics in place, um, observable, um, whether it meets the definition of done, whether you know it passes a pull request, and so on and so forth. We really need to bring security uh, into that mix as an integral part of what we class as quality. So we can't have you know quality. Uh, we can't have we can't claim that our infrastructure code or application code is of quality unless it's gone through various um, various tests uh, uh, to determine that, that security. So when I see this as um, something that we need to solve, I think there's three main areas that we need to look um, to determine, uh, to upskill, and, and make changes. And these are kind of the people, the processes, and, and the tooling. Um, I think the problem we have as developers is that security just generally isn't part of the training that we get. Um, you know, I think, um, again, back to the slide that, that Helen um, 
pop uh, at the beginning of, of her talk. You know, if you go through any course or, or university, we get taught about the code, we get taught about design patterns and algorithms. Uh, we might venture out to kind of SQL and uh, other kind of other uh, languages. Uh, if you're learning around now, you may you know have to learn about Docker and Kubernetes and, and things like that. But it's very rare that we get taught about security as, as developers. And I think this is a massive shame and something that we, we really need to, to kind of change in, in our industry. Excuse me. Um, because if we, if we train people to think about security right from the start, it changes the way that we write code. Um, it, even if it's just simple things like introducing our developers to the OWASP top 10, um, if I know what an idol of vulnerability is, will that change the way that I write my Spring Boot endpoints? I, I think it will. Will it change the way that I test my services? Uh, of course it will, because I, I've just added knowledge to um, about something that I'm, I'm building. Um, I think we need to be training people um, in things like um, ethical hacker training, uh, thinking like a hacker. Um, it, it will change the way that we write code in terms of testing. We'll write positive tests, as in this is this will do what I expect it to do. Uh, it will also then write you know the negative tests. We might then think to write tests about um, what does my app do if I supply some invalid input. Um, so things like that, I think, are the real kind of keys to to kind of the people part of this process. Um, if we can raise the bar in terms of um, the skill sets that our developers have, then we'll raise the bar in terms of security of the code that we write. Uh, but this is obviously a culture thing, um, and, and sometimes culture things are hard to change. Uh, but if we can if we can drive that forward as as kind of technology teams, then I think it's easier to kind of convince uh, kind of the management teams if they're not on board with that. Um, something that I think is great if you've got people in your organization or on your teams that uh, are really passionate about this side of things, then uh, security champions and, and creating security champions are, uh, is a great way to go because um, they can then drive this culture uh, throughout um, the individual teams and be the point of contact for you know, security related matters. So um, training, I think is, is kind of where we need to start on the people side of things. Um, and also kind of integrate it into the culture of, of the team. So uh, obviously we've talked about PRs and pull requests. Um, these can be a great opportunity for, for kind of teaching, um, especially kind of the junior programmers. Uh, but if we can kind of talk to people about security concerns in those PRs, um, that, that's a great way to, to kind of do this type of stuff. Um, going to meetups such as this um, about security, uh, the OWASP have like a huge number of meetups and local chapters in different areas. So getting you know developers along to those kind of things just exposes them to a whole different way of thinking about software that we, uh, that we build. Um, we used to do at Crunch uh, tech talks and lunch and learns. Uh, we haven't done them for a while, uh, but it's definitely something that we're going to pick up in 2022. Um, and those are a great way to take something really kind of small and bite size um, and kind of push it out to the rest of, of your developer team. So if you've got people who are interested in those things, then get them to do a 20 minute presentation um, uh, over a lunchtime and um, spread that knowledge throughout the teams. And of course, post-mortems or lessons learned, um, things like that. Uh, if you do have a vulnerability um, or a bug or, or something like that, then post-mortems are a great way to um, talk through those, understand them and um, make sure they don't reoccur. In terms of process, um, as I talked about before, we, we already have quite a good number of kind of processes in place in terms of our developer pipelines and our uh, CICD pipelines. Um, I think the easiest way to integrate these uh, new processes in is to just meet where we already are, integrate with existing processes, uh, not create new processes. So like I say, 
if you have a PR review process, then integrate the security, security aspect into that. Uh, if you use agile principles uh, and your teams each have a definition of done, um, it must meet these set of criteria to be considered as uh, a finished story, uh, then add security criteria to those uh, to that definition of done. Um, also, we need to look at whether we can interrupt these processes uh, for security incidents as well. So should we be using tools like um, Sonar or, or Sneak or uh, the OWASP dependency checker to break the build for uh, security related incidents? Um, so basically meeting developers where they are with their existing processes. But if we've got the skills internally uh, to our teams where we, we're kind of thinking about um, security right from the go, then we can integrate, you know, it sounds grand, but security threat modeling during the requirement stage or our refinement meetings in our sprints. So if we're given uh, a story to, for example, uh, a file upload functionality, we've got to build file upload functionality, then what are all of the things we need to think about uh, in terms of file uploads and the security risks associated to that. If we can build that into um, the stories right from the start, then we start to see this ripple through um, all of uh, our, our processes and requirements. Um, I, I guess the, the tooling is, um, is an interesting one. Um, we need tooling uh, to give us timely, accurate uh, security intelligence. Um, but it's, it's important that we have it all the way through our, our pipeline because um, things can enter um, our, our pipeline through to production uh, at various different stages. And obviously, it's not just the code that we write. As we said before, it's, it's the Docker Compose uh, files that we need to check. Um, it's the configuration around our infrastructure as code. And we we need to get these things um, as far left uh, as possible. So this is where the concept of kind of shifting left um, really comes into play. So this is what I mean by making the invisible visible, because a lot of this stuff is, is completely um, behind the scenes to us as developers. It's not something that we necessarily need to think about uh, on an ongoing basis, uh, but we need the tooling to surface this information to allow us to act on it uh, accordingly. Um, so the monitoring of dependencies is something that we, we need to bring into our ecosystem um, as soon as possible, really. If this is not something that you, you already have in, in your pipelines, uh, then uh, having something that, that alerts you, as is the case you know, when the log4j thing hit, um, how, how did you guys figured that there was a problem. Did, did you read about it on Twitter, talk to your teams about it, or were you alerted by some tooling or something like that, that Log4j had um, an in, uh, a vulnerability that we needed to address straight away? Um, and like I say, if we can get this throughout all our pipeline, then we cover um, all of the, uh, the issues. Um, and the further left that we can get it, if we can get this into our IDEs, um, then the, the better it is, really. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close here on, on this. Um, I spotted this on LinkedIn um, just the other day, and um, uh, Liran is um, really um, good in the kind of node security, um, Docker container security world. But it kind of struck me as, as an interesting statement to make. Um, and the, the comments on this post were kind of um, varied, but it did strike me as, as fundamentally true. We, we are all uh, security engineers, either by active participation in that activity or just by default, really. Um, if we don't engage in the security part, of the work that we do and our ecosystem, then um, you know that in and of itself is a, is a decision that, that we've made. It, it is there. You know there are people actively exploiting open source um, libraries. Um, you know the log for J. If anything, uh, the log for shell incident told us that um, 
you know, there are big wins out there for people who want to target open source uh, vulnerabilities. Um, so we are all security engineers, whether we like it or not. So I think engaging in that and, and making sure that we um, take that on as, a, as an active ongoing concern and we upscale, we, you know, we improve our processes and we bring tools into play that can help us with that, um, then that will make things um, uh, much, much better. So I'm going to leave this here with a, a few resources. Um, these are kind of things that I've, I've kind of found along the way um, that you know helped me uh, understand a few things a little bit better. Um, Tanya um, is a really great um, AppSec advocate. Um, she used to be a pen tester, uh, I think a red team pen tester. She now works under uh, She Hacks Purple. So take a look at, at her website. She also has uh, courses. Some of them are uh, free introductory courses. Other ones are AppSec related uh, courses. So take a look at that. Um, Learn uh, from Sneak is a great resource um, that teaches you about um, uh, SQL injection um, or um, how uh, it's even got something on the log4j there as well. But basically, uh, it, it tries to explain all the things um, uh, and vulnerabilities and, and how to mitigate them. Um, in terms of tooling, um, I've tried uh, Sneak. Sneak is a great app. Um, they have a free plan. So if you've got um, your own GitHub account or anything like that, um, sign up to the free account, connect to your repositories. Um, you'd be amazed at the things that, that come back. Um, uh, I tried this the first time around and uh, a number of projects that I had on there that I hadn't touched for a while had a fair number of high classification vulnerabilities uh, in the dependencies that they use. Um, and it's a real eye opener. It really is a case of bringing, you know, making the invisible visible. Um, Zap proxy and uh, the OWASP dependency check are similar tools um, to, to sneak in that they uh, help you uh, test your app uh, for the Zap one and dependency check. So definitely check those out. Um, if you're interested in uh, the training side, so uh, introducing your you or your team to um, kind of upskilling. Uh, Try Hack Me is is a great way just to kind of dip your toe into the water of um, ethical hacking and and thinking like a hacker. Um, DevSlop is uh, an OWASP uh, project uh, where they have uh, resources and YouTube channel uh, where they post um, some really really good content um, to help upskill your team and, and yourself. Um, and all of these things will, will start to slowly shift your thinking around the, the code that, that we write um, and how we make that code uh, a little bit more secure day by day um, and how we really use um, quality, uh, how we use security as a measure of quality alongside all the other things that we use. 